Hello, my name is uh, Linus Valterius and I am product manager for the mobile app Bearing Assist that I will just share briefly in the end with you today. And then over to our main speaker, Hans. Yes, thank you. Um, I am working as a senior application engineer with is it four, four decades of application engineering experience. And today I want to share some of my learnings from the particular mounting method, vertical shaft. So let's move into that. Um, in brief, today we will look at mounting of bearings in vertical shaft fashion. Some words on why this is a common method. And we will dive a bit deeper looking at what happens inside a bearing during such a mounting sequence. Um, try to see if there are any mechanical consequences of the bearings of that. And uh, pinpoint a couple of risks associated with the, some of the consequences. I will touch upon uh, some potential damage types and of course also we shall spend time on how to avoid such damages. And uh, finally we'll wrap up with Linus again talking about bearing assist. So mounting bearings in vertical fashion. <clears throat> this is really a common practice. And if it's performed correctly, this is perfectly well, perfectly okay. Now, why is it so so common to, to work in vertical fashion? Well, uh, it comes with using hot mounting of gears, uh, bearings, couplings, etc. This is very practical. We use the heating to, to uh, expand uh, the, comp the component we want to mount because then we can slide it onto the shaft seat and when it cools down it shrinks and it will sit there with an interference fit. So we have the expansion, the mounting, the shrinking process going on. And heating today is done for steel components easily and very cost effective with induction heating. This is not rocket science. However, also Hot mounting uh, makes vertical fashion very interesting because it makes the handling of the components very easy. Uh, we get access to the side face, for instance, if we look at the little illustration, this is the gear and we have access to the side face so we can have lifting device to and from the heater and, and of course to the shaft where we want to mount it. Uh, when we have mounted it, uh, gravity will help us to, to keep the component pressed against the abutment where we want to locate it. And last but absolutely not least, the centering of, for instance, the bearing onto the shaft seat is very easy when we have the shaft uh, vertical. And why is that interesting? Well, hot mounting. Uh, we need to have a warm component, sufficiently warm, warm to present the clearance uh, onto the shaft seat. And uh, it must be easy and fast to, to position the bearing because we are losing temperature and we do not want to get stuck halfway. Because then we can't move the, the thing if it's a bearing or, or a hub, e either on or off. This is not where we want to end up. Uh, so, I think the easy and fast centering when mounting is in the core of the choice of vertical shaft. And this could, for instance, be a warm bearing fitted onto a room tempered shaft seat. We have the shaft standing here, we have the warm bearing here, and we fit it onto its abutment. It could be a room tempered shaft placed in a warm bearing room tempered bearing placed in a warm housing or a warm housing fitted on a room tempered shaft mounted bearing 
And we will look at one such practical case later on. There could be other combinations, including cooling and, and, and heating, of course. Now, compared to hubs or gears, bearings behave uh, differently. And this is because the clearance in the bearing, uh, it will change during the heating, mounting, cooling process. We look at these examples I gave, um, for instance, the warm bearing on a room temperature shaft seat. First, the clearance is increasing, then it's decreasing. The next example, in fact, is the same. Third example, same. Clearance increases, then decreases. And the fourth example, clearance is increasing and then decreasing. Other combinations will follow the same pattern. So, Already here, we can draw an important conclusion. Heating and or cooling used to mount bearings will initiate the same clearance increase followed by clearance decrease cycle. Now, uh, bearings have a relation between radial and axial clearance uh, and it's defined by the contact angle. It looks like this for double row bearings. <clears throat> the axial clearance is 2.3 times the factor Y0 times the radial clearance. Uh, the Y0 you will find in, in uh, our catalogs, product catalogs. And following this little equation here, we will find that the axial clearance is typically between 5 and 15 times the radial clearance. Uh, this means that a small movement in the radial direction will induce a large or allow a large movement axially. So if we look at a double row bearing here is a paper roller bearing. The small radial clearance corresponds to a large axial motion possibility. Same uh, you can see in a spherical roller bearing where the small radial clearance corresponds to a large axial movability. Now, if we now have the bearing on a vertical shaft, a radial clearance change will result in an axial motion. So let's start with a, an example, um, the warm bearing, and I have colored the rings, the components here, red to highlight that this is a warm bearing. Here in this situation, both rings have the same temperature, meaning a small bearing clearance, like when it was manufactured. We have supported this bearing in this example on the outer ring, you can see that. And the inner ring is slightly displaced downwards in its clearance. We now insert a room tempered shaft, much colder than the inner ring. And we lower it into the inner ring, so it seats against this button. That shaft will now cool the inner ring and we have shown the inner ring gray to, to show this. Now the inner ring is colder, read smaller, so we have increased the bearing clearance and the inner ring is now displaced downwards in the enlarged axial clearance. Sometime later, also the outer ring and the rotor set is room tempered. Both rings are now shown gray. They have the same temperature again, meaning that the bearing clearance is restored to its small original clearance. And now the inner ring has been forced to move upwards while the clearance was reduced. So far, um, maybe we have looked at an example of interesting applied physics but does this matter? Let us, before answering that, let's look at what is happening inside the bearing. Uh, the first sequence is when the inner ring moves downwards. Uh, the vertical load from shaft and whatever 
is, is acting in the vertical direction is carried by the lower row of rollers here. There are individual roller loads. Uh, the normal forces are marked red, and there's frictional loads marked black, and they are counteracting motion as always, so they are directed upwards. If we do the math here, well, okay, there, there's a contact angle as well, and a number of rollers. If we do the math, finding out what is the individual rolling element load, we find that little equation. Now we will, will not dissecate this one. But if we look at the denominator here, we will find that the larger the friction is, the coefficient of friction, the larger the denominator becomes and the smaller the rolling element load. So in this situation, friction actually reduces the, the rolling element load, the red arrow. Now, the second sequence is that the inner ring moves upwards. We still have gravity acting, and that is carried by the lower row. Uh, normal loads are marked red. And we have the frictional loads in black. And since they also now counteract the motion, they are now directed in a reversed direction. So we have the contact angle, we do the math, and now we find that um, an increased friction here actually will reduce the denominator, making the rolling element load larger. So now, during this sequence, the upwards motion sequence, the friction will increase the load. So during this situation with the increasing rolling element load, if we look at the denominator part here, if sine for the contact angle happens to equal the coefficient of friction times cosine for the contact angle, we will see that the denominator becomes zero. And in theory, we would have infinitely large rolling element loads. In reality, we will, of course, not see infinite loading, but we will anyhow create very large roller loads. There's no doubt about that. And in that situation, there might be a situation where we risk to self-lock the bearing or cause smearing inside the bearing. Now, what are the combinations of friction and contact angles that cause this self-locking situation? Well, that is when the denominator becomes zero, meaning that the coefficient of friction is equal to tangents for that particular contact angle in the bearing. If I draw that equation, it's a simple, almost straight line. We have on the horizontal shaft uh, axis here, we have uh, the contact angle in the bearing. And on the vertical axis, we have possible coefficients of friction. Uh, for the typical bearings we use, this machinery, contact angles range, say, from four degrees up to 15, just to give you the ballpark. And what coefficient of frictions will we see? Well, they would range, say, between 0 0.05 and up to 0 0.5. So now we know that there is a potential self-lock zone. Uh, and what would be the damages associated with that? We, we, we saw earlier that the self-lock causes very large rolling element loads. So plastic deformation could occur. And if it occurs, we will, uh, depending on the speed, but we would certainly notice vibrations or even noise. We could also uh, notice very early spalling, premature failures. Now, what if the bearing almost self locks? Almost self locking, what is that? Well, uh, we then have a situation where the friction is sufficient 
to stop the initial motion, but as the roller loading increases, it cannot resist motion at higher lows. So it will, at the end of the day, it will move in its sleep. Then we have a situation with large contact forces developed, but finally we will see a roller mo motion and it moves in the axial direction, of course. Now, damages associated with such a situation, we have high loads and, and axial motion. Uh, that would be burnishing, uh, that's the, the kinder version, or the worst case, smearing. But there is a smearing risk zone. Uh, the burnishing would cause shiny, thin axial marks. Uh, generally speaking, they, they don't cause any harm. Maybe they could be picked up as a false condition monitoring signal, but nothing worse than that. Uh, however, if we develop into smearing, we would see uh, surface distress. We would see that smearing damage copy from raceway to rolling element, from rolling element to raceway, and, uh, and over the operating time of the, the bearing, we will see the, the surfaces erode. And that will uh, lead to surface distress and it will be experienced as a severe wear, but it takes some time. So this far we have identified two potentially harmful situations. Either the bearing could self-lock, causing plastic deformations that we would notice as noise or vibrations, or worse, early spooling. Then we would, of course, see that on some roller distance. At least if we are lucky enough to spot this in an early stage, if the bearing rolls on, that roller distance spooling will uh, erase itself, it will spread onto the entire circumference and then we have lost the rolling element distance and then we have difficulties to, to see the origin. Or the other situation where we had this almost self-locking situation where burnishing kind version would cause uh, shiny marks, maybe false monitoring signals, or worse, surface distress resulting in wear. Now, rhetoric questions, are such damages seen in machines? I would say sometimes if, if we are early and spot them uh, so we can uh, trace them back to, to uh, uh, mounting sequence, but that happens uh, quite seldom. So uh, it's not easy to identify a, a advanced stage damage as a minute surface defect from a mounting damage. I'll give you some examples here. Uh, this is uh, caught in an early stage. Here we have local early deep spalling, and this has happened on road distance. Uh, as you can understand, if we would continue to using this bearing, uh, this damage would spread and, and we would lose the rolling distance, roller element distance. This is another case where, where the, we didn't see, I think, I'm pretty sure that we did not see uh, roller distance spalling. We would rather see a gradually developing wear. Now this was a mystery because uh, nothing was wrong with the lubrication. There was no dirt. Uh, good oils used, good presence of oil, so there were no apparent reasons to develop this type of wear. But we could uh, we could backtrace it to a mounting issue. Um, so I, I will walk you through two cases where we have done measurements during mounting. First case, it's a wind turbine main shaft and they use vertical shaft fashion to mount bearings and hatches. First, we put a warm bearing onto the seat and we leave it to cool 
to near room temperature. And then we uh, approach uh, with a warm housing and we mount that on the outer ring. And we, in this case, we measured the axial motion. Uh, so uh, first we heat the housing and this is uh, done with an induction heater. And then we mount that vertically from top uh, onto the bearing outer ring. Actually, this is me uh, with a white helmet. I'm looking at the exclusive, highly scientific dial indicators that we use to monitor the movement. So uh, schematically, we have this situation. The shaft is standing on the floor. We have warmed the bearing and we mount it from above. It sits resting on uh, an abutment. While the bearing cools, we are warming up the housing to fit it onto the outer ring. And we now mount the warm housing from above and we let it rest on, on the outer ring. And during the cooling sequence, we are measuring the outer ring uh, versus inner ring motion during about roughly an hour of temperature equalization. And we end up with this graph here. Uh, we find three zones. The first zone is actually a, a quite a rapid motion. We, we load the outer ring with the housing and it moves downwards. This is mainly radial deflection. There's of course some axial motion, but the majority of, of this is uh, radial elastic deflection of the bearing. Uh, zone two is more interesting then, because here we are heating, uh, the, the, the housing provides heat to the outer ring, the uh, outer ring expands, clearance increases, and it moves further down until we reach the beginning of zone three where there is no more heat input from the housing to the outer ring. So the clearance is not increasing. On the contrary, now the housing is actually cooling the outer ring. So the clearance is decreasing and the outer ring is moving upwards because of the reduced clearance. Uh, these little notches, I, I actually believe that we see some kind of stick slip behavior. So, so here we would expect this almost self-lock situation. And when we uh, disassemble this rather large bearing, as you saw on the illustration, we find on, on some of the rollers uh, surface burnishing. This is a, a, <clears throat> a shiny axial, uh, not so wide mark. Uh, it's a rather mild damage. It's burnishing, it's not smearing. Uh, the second case is an industrial gearbox uh, where the shaft and, and actually the gear as well, they are mounted vertically. So first we place the bearing in the housing. Uh, we put an inner ring on top, uh, a distance ring on top of the inner ring. And then we uh, put a warm, quite warm gear on top of that distance ring, resting on the inner ring. And finally, we insert from above a, a very cool uh, shaft. It's very cold. And we insert it through the um, gear, through the distance ring and through the inner ring. And then we let temperature equalize. And during this, we measure the axial motion. Uh, this is a monoblock design, so uh, to fit the components into the casing, we turn it sideways, we open up the top cover, and we look into the gearbox like this. So here I have it schematically, the room tempered casing is resting on a mounting stand. And the uh, put in the bearing sideways and down. And now the bearing sits where it should sit in its bearing seat. 
and the outer ring rests in the casing. We put in the distance ring, top in the ring. And here we come with that warm red gear and we put it sideways and it's placed on top of the distance ring. And finally, a very cold shaft. It's actually cooled via liquid nitrogen. It's coming from above, uh, through the gear, through the distance ring and into the inner ring. And this uh, equalizes in temperature. And we make the measurements again to, to notice the or register the motion between outer ring and inner ring in the axial direction. Now to get axis, uh, we actually didn't use a real gearbox casing. We made a dummy housing so we could access uh, and measure the motion. And this is uh, a blurry photograph taken from above on that dummy housing showing our highly scientific dial indicators used to monitor the motion here. You also see that little distance ring slightly displaced here. And here this is a photo from the cooling of the shaft. It's is immersed in or submerged in liquid nitrogen. And here's the graph uh, from the measurements. Again, we see three zones. And the first zone is that the inner ring is rapidly cooled by the enormously cold shaft. The clearance is increasing, the inner ring with the shaft and the gear moves downwards. Uh, when zone two starts, actually uh, the, the very heavy, it's a big mass of gear, quite warm. It is now, it has now heated the shaft and the heat goes through the shaft into the inner ring. And that one is getting warmer and warmer and it's expanding. So the clearance is decreasing and the inner ring with the shaft and the gear is moving upwards. In the zone three, uh, I, I actually believe that there is no real motion taking place. We are likely measuring uh, a temperature related dimensional changes of the, the test set up here. So the interesting part is the zone one really where we have the upwards motion, large loads, large rolling element loads. Also here we notice a couple of notches in the in the graph and, and I think these are stick slip occasions. And they may have caused the smearing that we observed. Uh, this is the look of uh, one spot on the lower raceway in the test bearing. This does not display anything that looks very alarming. It's a very thin axial scratch type of mark on it. Um, so to the naked eye, it looks like this. You, you can clearly notice this with your fingernails. So something has happened here. This is not burnishing, which is just shiny. This is worse than burnishing. Uh, it belongs uh, bit to the story that not all of the rolling elements have left such contact marks. And it's not so strange. In, in my ideal world, when I created that equation that we looked at earlier, all rollers were expected to share the load equally. Now, in reality, that is not always the case because the, the, the individual rollers can find individual positions. Some may carry a little bit more load, others less. That's not strange at all. Uh, now, they are noticeable by your fingernails. So we put them up in the microscope and now we see something more alarming than a thin line. Uh, the blue arrow is the rolling direction, same as in the photograph here. You see the uh, polishing marks in the circumferential direction. And here we have transverse marks. This is from the axial transverse motion. And the red arrow points at 
a part where we have actual cold welding. This is really material transfer roller to raceway. Now, this is a serious damage. This is a hard, rather uh, large RA value. The surface uh, roughness is quite high here. You notice it with your nail. This will copy and develop to wear. So, uh, how should we act to avoid such mounting initiated damages? Well, we, we have three factors and we can work on all of them. We can reduce or hopefully eliminate the load. We can release the friction or avoid the motion or work on all three here. Um, avoiding vertical shaft fashion mounting eliminates the vertical load at least. We can also stick to the vertical shaft mounting, but counteract gravity, work with springs or counterweights, other techniques. We could also imagine that we mount the bearing in a vertical fashion and then tilt the shaft to horizontal fashion when uh, it's cooling down. Then we avoid this upward motion with large forces. Release the friction. Is, is quite easy and, and generally speaking, uh, experienced fitters, they, they adopt this technique. You rotate or slightly oscillate the bearing during cooling because then you release the friction and, and you, uh, you don't build up these forces. Um, the issue is here that you need to do this during a large part of the cooling uh, time, so it could take quite some time. Or avoid the motion. You could use a tool to center the bearing axially during the cooling. So, what are the takeaways from this session here? First of all, I, I want to uh, deliver an awareness of damage risk associated with vertical shaft fashion mounting. Because mounting of rolling roller bearings with a contact angle in vertical shaft fashion using heating and cooling will change the clearance and we will risk to self lock or, or smear. And we may then initiate damages that are difficult to identify as mounting related. Because when, when the bearing is taken out, because it's noisy. Uh, the initial stage is long since worn away. Uh, some other takeaways. Uh, there are ways, of course, to minimize the damage risk. Oscillation during cooling to release friction. Uh, support uh, to reduce the loading and counteract gravity. We can consider horizontal shaft mounting. That's, that's quite possible. And to uh, ease the mind of people who are afraid of the centering, it's very common to work uh, with springs that carry the load of the bearing, and then it's, it's quite easy by hand to center it. Other methods are to work with the tapered shaft seat and drive it up hydraulically facilitated by oil injection, for instance. And we are there, SKF, of course, uh, in Vatus for a design review, uh, improve the mounting practice, train your fitters. You should ask SKF to assist on this. Uh, and talking about assist, I, I now hand over to Linus that will finish by presenting the SKF bearing assist. Thanks for now. Thank you so much, uh, Hans, for a very interesting presentation. I hope that there's more than me that find this super interesting and a lot to learn. Uh, so we will move on to talking about the mobile app bearing assist, and I will start with some facts. Um, in industrial applications uh, globally, uh, 
we know that there is hundreds of millions of bearings that are being replaced every year. Uh, and from experience, we also know that one of six bearings that do fail do so due to incorrect mounting. And uh, if you think that sounds high, I, I also hope that after this presentation, you understand that the reason is more often mounting than we might realize or understand when we evaluate the bearings. So many bearings, they do fail due to incorrect mounting. And, and uh, this is something that we really would like to address. Uh, we, we develop and produce bearings to make your machines run and not to fail. So we really want to help everyone who mounts the bearing to do it correct. Uh, and with that uh, assignment, we start to talk to technicians who do mount bearings and ask them how, how could we better support them. And, and they told us that uh, you could really help us to make your instructions and information how to do things right more accessible. Uh, and with that input, we started to develop the Bearing Assist mobile app with the intent to help everyone who do mount bearings to do it uh, like an expert, uh, quickly, easy, and correct. So uh, in the mobile app, I will not show so much more than this, but in the app, you will find the product information. Uh, there is a search guide that can help you to find the right bearings, uh, maybe the bearing type number or designation have worn off and, and you're trying to identify uh, what the bearing you need to replace. Uh, there is a functionality for that. We have calculations included both for bearing life, for lubrication, for frequencies. Uh, and of course, we have instructions for both the dismounting and mounting. Uh, and we also added on request uh, a function to document how you perform your mountings so that it can be shared with other colleagues and, and people within your maintenance organization to better share information, share experience and knowledge uh, for more effective maintenance operations. Uh, I hope that made you curious enough to, after this session, go directly to App Store or Google Play, depending on if you use an uh, iOS device or uh, Android device, to try it out yourself. I think that is the best way to discover the app. And uh, if you want more information, you can find it on our homepage. There is also a demo video available on YouTube if you search for Bearing Assist. Uh, and with those words, I want to thank you uh, for listening.